that, that town, Bethany, he always went to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. And so we're going to talk about that. As you recall, Judas, when Mary broke the alabaster jar of expensive perfume on Jesus and anointed him, right? Do you remember what Judas said? He complained. You know what religious people do? Um, I mean religious, not like you and me. I'm talking religious, like people who have religion but no relationship, right? No spirit. The spirit brings mercy and grace, right? But there's religious people who are just hardcore, hard to the core. They're mean. Religion can make people mean as snakes. If you don't have the spirit of God, you'll be mean as a snake sometimes. So Judas complained about the waste of money. We get sold it and give it to the poor. Turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, verse 10. I love Jesus comes to her defense. Isn't that great? Jesus was always for the underdog. And women in that, in that society were the underdogs. So uh, verse 10 of chapter 26 of Matthew says, Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, this is a woman who used to be a prostitute. She got saved, now she's following Jesus, she's worshipped Jesus in an incredible, incredible way. And so now she's more famous than anybody, right? Just think of all the human beings who have graced the earth throughout its history, and how many people are famous? How many people are famous from 2,000 years ago when this woman lived? Not many. But we are preaching about this woman today. We even know her name. Mary. So, Jesus, in his culture, he was a radical. He elevated women. Check this out. He elevated women, as seen here, and in, in the many other encounters Jesus had with women. Do you remember when Jesus was at the well in Samaria, and there was the woman at the well? That's what they called her. Uh, the humane and respectful way Jesus treated all women, and especially the woman at the well. It may not appear unusual to the readers of today, yet what he did was extremely unusual even radical. He ignored the prevailing view that saw women as inferior beings. When at the well in Samaria, he started a conversation with her, a Samaritan and a woman in public. The rabbinic oral law was quite explicit. Okay, The rabbis had their own law. right? They just added laws and laws and laws on top of God's law. Okay. And the law was very specific about women. It says, he who talks with a woman in public brings evil upon himself. That's crazy. The rabbis were coming up with some crazy laws. Another rabbinic teaching prominent in Jesus' day taught, quote, one is not so much as to greet a woman in public. So we can understand why his disciples were amazed to find Jesus talking to the woman at the well. You weren't even supposed to greet women in public. Can you imagine how it must have stunned the lady that Jesus offered her living water? You're a rabbi, right? They thought he was a rabbi, a teacher, a great teacher, and here he was, caring about her soul, caring about her. Among Jesus' best friends was women. Mary, Martha, they were the sisters of Lazarus who entertained him at his home. Martha assumed the traditional female role of preparing a meal for Jesus, her guest, while her sister Mary did what only men were allowed to do, learn from Jesus. Mary was the cultural deviant, but so was Jesus because he violated the rabbinic law of his day about speaking to women. By teaching Mary spiritual truths, he violated another rabbinic law. Is this interesting to anybody? Which said, let the words of the law be burned rather than talk to a woman. If a man teaches his daughter the law, it is as though he taught her lechery. Wow, how far mankind can get away from God's heart. So Jesus had to come back to earth and say, listen, you guys have got some crazy laws going on. I'm going to straighten you out. <laughs> he straightened us out. The Apostle Paul followed Jesus' lead on elevating women. He calls men to love their wives. 
right? Love your wives in a self-sacrificing way like Christ loved the church. And in a culture where a wife was considered property and a dis disrespected piece of property at that, Paul elevates women to a position of honor previously unknown in the whole world. Man. Paul also provided highly countercultural direction for the New Testament church. In the Jewish synagogue, women had no place and they had no voice in public worship. In the pagan temples, the women were there only to be as prostitutes. But the New Testament church changed everything. On the other hand, our church, taught by Jesus and Paul, was a place for women to pray and prophesy out loud. The spiritual gifts are given to women as well as men. All the women should be shouting hallelujah right now. <laughs> Older women are commanded to teach the younger women's women. The invitation to women to participate in the worship of Jesus was unthinkable in that culture. And the New Testament, the new church, allowed women to serve in leadership positions. In Romans 16.1. There's a, a woman deaconess, a deacon in the Centuria church named Phoebe. So not only were women filled with the Holy Spirit, they're able to speak in tongues, they're able to speak and prophesy. They were they were leaders, and they're also leaders in the church, they're also deacons in the church. Wow, you talk about a new paradigm, a cultural shift. Jesus shifted it. So Christianity, Christianity, I mean real biblical Christianity, and not some of the third, fourth century fathers who were chauvinists, okay? There has been chauvinists. It's cultural. It's not out of the Bible, okay? There's some real chauvinists you know, who are church leaders. But we compare the uh, Western culture to Middle Eastern cultures and Far Eastern cultures, and you can see a huge difference on the status of women, can't you? The way the Japanese treat their women or the Muslims treat their women. How do we treat our women in the Western culture? It's all based on the New Testament. So we owe a debt of gratitude, women, to Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Now back to our dinner with Simon the ex-leper. Or should we say, uh, our Mary the ex-sinful woman. We cannot rush through the story. It's very meaty. And I got three points to my sermon. Take out a pen and paper. Write these three points down. They're really fantastic. I preached about this last week, but then I thought, man, I rushed through that thing. There's so much more there. There's got to be more. Jesus included it in the Bible, so it's got to be there. There's got to be a lot there. Point number one. Just think of all the stuff that was not included in the Bible that Jesus did. There's just tons and tons of stuff. Paul said if everything was written down that Jesus did, it would fill up all the libraries. There just wouldn't be enough. So the stuff that made it into the Bible is really important. Point number one is she worshipped Jesus extravagantly. Point number two, and leave space between these, these three. She worshipped Jesus publicly. Point number three, she worshipped Jesus in spite of her past. In spite of her past. And everybody said, praise God for that. Because we all have a past. Amen? She worshipped God extravagantly, publicly, and in spite of her past. Extravagantly, publicly, and in spite of her past. Point number one, she worshipped Jesus extravagantly. She spared no expense to worship Jesus. She gave Jesus something valuable. And I think that says a lot to us in the church. Our worship to Jesus, our singing, I mean, worship entails everything, not just singing, right? But it includes singing. Singing and giving. In your giving, you should be extravagant. In your lifestyle, right? Our lifestyle of serving Jesus, it should cost us something to serve Jesus. There should be sacrifices made for the kingdom of God. David set a great example of this extravagant worship. If you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, we're going to look at a quick little episode about David. I love David because um, he was a normal guy. And I think probably any of us with his power and influence and money probably would have made some of the same mistakes he did. He was proud of his army, right? He was defeating Philistines. He was, he was winning. He was a winner. He was like Tim Tebow. He was a winner. <laughs> so he's going around defeating the Philistines and defeating and defeating, and he's just awesome. So one day he says, man, our army's so awesome. I wonder how many there are. Let's count them. Well, he, he wasn't allowed to count 
because he wanted God wanted him to rely on God's strength, not on man's strength. So God got really upset, and he sent he sent Gad the seer. Okay, that was a prophet. They called them seers. So Gad the prophet came to David and said, "David, you have angered God. God's ready to kill you." And David said, "Oh no." Have you ever sinned big time and your wife tells you? <laughs> then you're like, oh, I didn't even know I did that. Right? It happens. David sinned, didn't realize it, but then he had a contrite heart. But Gad the seer said, you got three choices, okay? You could have three years of famine, three months of enemy losses. I mean, when the enemy comes in, just wipes you out. Three months of that. Or you could have three days of the sword of the Lord. So David thought about it. He said, you know what? Our God is a merciful God. I'd rather fall in the hands of a merciful God than the hands of my enemy. They probably don't have any mercy. So uh, the death angel came and started killing with the plague. The plague killed 70,000 70, people. And David saw, he saw this angel in the sky above Aramal's uh, threshing floor. Saw this angel with a giant sword. And he ran to the threshing floor and he said, i got to do something. I've got to stop this plague. It's killing thousands of people. And in 1 Chronicles 21, 22, that's where we're going to take out the reading. Verse 22, David said, Let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. Okay. David's heart's in the right place. Verse 23, Aaron all said to David, Take it. <laughs> right? Let my Lord the King do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give you the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give, I will just give it all to you, David. Stop this plague. But David replied to Aaron, oh, this is really important. He says, no, I insist on paying full price. I will not take from the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. Are you with me? Underline that in your Bible. I'm not going to give to the Lord what costs me nothing. That's a famous phrase in the Bible. We need to put it in our memory bank. And so verse 25 says, so, so David paid 600 shekels of gold for the site. 26 says, David built an altar to the Lord and there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings and the plague stopped. And he says, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. Our worship should cost us something, my friends. If, if you're serving the Lord doesn't hamper your lifestyle, maybe you're not serving the Lord. Right? If, if you're giving in the offering, it's not hurting your checkbook, maybe you're not really giving enough. Our service should cost us time. Our gifts should cost us. And all of this should cost us because the Lord is worth our very best. I don't think it's right for people to minister before the Lord without having paid a price. Right? As a, a Sunday school teacher, Greg told me one time he studies for four hours. He pays the price to teach Sunday school. That's incredible. He's not going to come to church and give to the Lord what costs him nothing. I think people who play instruments should practice throughout the week. Right? I might be crazy about that, but don't get up here unless you practice because we're going to give to the Lord something we've really worked on that's cost us something. I don't think people should get up here and read off of lyric sheets. <laughs> right? Okay, I'm just going to move past that. You didn't like that. <laughs> Have you ever seen when someone get up and sing a special? I don't know. I just don't like it. We should, we should come prepared. Do everything as unto the Lord. Even lay people, the Bible says, should come. Even you should come to church. Pre prepared. Yeah. What? I th I'm just doing good. Get here. You know how hard it is to get kids up in the morning? <laughs> yeah, I know. I've raised two kids almost all the way. I've raised two kids. I know how hard it is. The devil gets at you in the morning, doesn't he, on Sunday morning. You can get up to school. That's easy. Go to church. That's a tough one. 1 Corinthians 14 says this. 14, 26 says, What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together? Okay, he's talking about coming to church. He says, when you come together, each one of you has a hymn or a word of instruction or a revelation or a tongue or an interpretation. <laughs> right? So, not only does the pastor have to be prepared, Sunday school leaders and our teachers have to be prepared, but you have to be prepared. Be prayed up, read up, read, get up early, read the Bible, come to church with something to offer. If I call on you, did you get up and say, hey, you know, I've been studying the scripture, man, and God's been burning all my heart, and, and I just want to tell you, you know, could you stand up and give a little short little testimony, sermonette? 
So point number one is she gave an extravagant gift that cost her a great deal. Is your faith costing you a great deal? Is your worship extravagant? Pastor, does Jesus really care about how much I give? I've wondered that too. Does Jesus take notice? Well, there is a story in the Bible that says that Jesus and the disciples were hanging out in the back of the church like the seniors. The seniors love to sit in the back seat, so <laughs> Jesus and the disciples were back there. And in the synagogue, they'd have these big black boxes on the back of the church. And people would put their tithes and their offerings in as they would leave. Um, nowadays, we kind of put a big, strong, scary man in your face. And give you the, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so back then, they just dropped stuff in the plate. So Jesus and his disciples were hanging out and watching people what they were giving. Isn't that curious? And so they were watching people put in some big money and little money. And this one little widow, she put in one little penny. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, hey, dude. He says, she's given more than all the rest. No, Lord, I saw her give. I saw the people give big wads of money, cash, paper money. And, and uh, Jesus said, yeah, but she gave all that she had. Right? Percentage-wise, she might have given 100% of all the money she had in her life. These other folks, they might have given only 1% of what they had. They go home, they got a ton of money at home. It didn't even hurt them, you know? So Jesus said, she gave more. It hurt her. It cost her, right, to give. That was incredible. Why would he tell that parable? Why would he put that in there? We need to be extravagant givers. The love of money is the root of all evil, the Bible says. Right? So there's a streak of the love of money running through every one of our veins. And I'll tell you, the more we give, we get that streak that vein of the love of money out of our hearts and out of our lives. And I, I think we got to prove it to Jesus. Say, Lord, money has no hold on me. Money has no hold on me. I'm going to give it. Give it away. Um, so I, our worship, whether it's money or talent or service in ministry, should cost us a great deal. Be, be free with your worship. Be extravagant. Be over the top for Jesus. Do you agree with that statement? Be over the top for Jesus. Was Jesus over the top for us? That's the understatement of the year. Jesus was over the top for you and me, man. He died on the cross. We weren't even born yet. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. He just did it because he loves us so much. Have you ever seen the TV show um, Extreme RVs? love that show, man. I like to see how the other half lives. <laughs> I love watching that show, and I like the uh, uh, extreme log homes. I could live in a log home, man. They are so gorgeous. It's not like Lincoln's log home. <laughs> These have changed. These are... Would you call that extreme? Extra, would you say that's extravagant? That's extravagant. Isn't it interesting how we applaud people who do that? Oh... If you have an extreme log home, yes, my home was featured on extreme log homes. Oh, you're so awesome. And we lift up people who have these extreme whatever cars, right? Log homes, right? How come we don't lift up people who live for Jesus extreme and extravagant? Are we off? I think we're off. It makes me appreciate guys like David Green the owner of Hobby Lobby. Okay, would you say he's got some money? Yeah. I have a friend who works for him. He went into his office. His office is a museum. It's so huge. His working office is just full of stuff. He's gotten artifacts, ancient artifacts from all over the world. A lot of Bible scriptures. He's a collector, world-class collector. But do you know that he gives away over 50% of his pre-tax income on all of his stores? The dude's operating on less than 50%. He has given God from his businesses. This is not his take-home pay. This is what his stores make. I mean, I call that extravagant giving. I'm like, hey, maybe that's the key to his success. Maybe one day he said, God, I'm going to start this store full of junk for women. And I'm going to give. It's going to be from China. Everything's going to 
to be from China. <laughs> and God, we're going to... God's gone. David, are you sure about that? Yes. I don't, God, I'm just going to do it. But I'm going to, God, I'm going to give 50, over 50% 50 of what we make to you. God says, all right, there's, <laughs> there's a good idea, little David. <laughs> Come on, man. It's like David and Goliath. And he made that store huge. Made that store huge with God's blessing. I tell you, if you have a, a private business, if you have your own business, you need to start tithing on your private company. Test God in this area, right? God said, test me on your ties, and I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing. You will have an office that is a museum. That is fantastic. And then, David goes against our whole government in the Obamacare thing, and he wins. David Green won. God is blessing everything that man is doing. I don't even want to go off. That's not even part of my sermon. <laughs> Point number two. I just get these thoughts, these random thoughts. Jesus worshipped, I mean, she, the woman, worshipped Jesus publicly. That's important, Christians. This is not a private little religion for you and Jesus. This is a religion that's got to flourish, and you've got to be like a flower that everybody can see, and they'll say, that's a Christian. <clears throat> They have the love of a Christian. They have the patience of a Christian. I mean, your faith has just got to be so evident to everybody. I mean, you don't have to wear Christian t-shirts, and you don't have to have crosses all over everything and on your car. I don't have any religious anything on my car. Just in case I cut someone off when I'm speeding. <laughs> I don't want to hurt the name of Jesus, but... But I do wear Christian t-shirts to the gym, and everybody looks at them. But our worship should be so public and everybody should know that God is alive in our hearts and our lives, man. When you're at the, rec the break room at work and you got your little sandwich in a bag that your wife... Does your wife ever make sandwiches for you? Does she put little notes in there? Okay, maybe that, that was like yesteryear. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> your wife now says, just go out to eat somewhere. <laughs> I'm tired. No, I'm joking. I'm getting way off track. <laughs> and so, bow your head and pray over your little sandwich. Right? Come out of the closet, man. The gays are coming out of the closet. You come out of the closet. Come out of the closet, Christian. And serve Jesus wholeheartedly. I was so proud of this church. Um, Wednesday, we had a tragedy happen in our area. The helicopter went down and nine or 11 men lost their lives. And so I, was, I woke up and Julie was watching the news and I was like, oh my goodness. And it said Eglin Air Force Base. And I said, that's close by. And then I started like listening and thinking, no, that's not Eglin, that's Navarre. Yeah. And so I ran down to my mom's house. She lives over here next to the water. I went out on her dock and there's a man there, Navy guy with big old tattoos, his old arms, all tattoos, very colorful. And him and his wife were there and they looked like they had lost their best friend. I said, hey, how you doing? My mom's Mary, and they go, oh, Mary, we love Mary. Because when Mary, when they first moved here, my mother went over and brought them food. And they were starving, they didn't have any food, and they had kids, and so she just blessed them. They just, oh, they love Mary. Yeah. So I said, I'm her son. So we hit it off right away, and um, they're Christians, and he was just so downcast. And I said, what's going on? He said, do you see all these orange bags all the way down the beach? I said, yeah. He said, a minute ago, an Air Force guy came by and put body parts in the orange bags. And all along the beach were body parts from our men who served and crashed. And, and then there was a big wheel, and the wheel assembly was on the beach, and then a side of the cockpit was right there, the, the side door. And I thought, man, that's sad. It just broke my heart. And I said, what can I do? I want to do something. Ray, like you, I want to do something. And so I said, what can I do? I'm just a preacher of the church. And a lady called from Jacksonville. She was a reporter. She called up from Jacksonville Daily News, and she said, oh, what's happened over there? And we told her, she said, are you guys going to do anything? This is what the world is looking for, the church to do something. And I said, without even thinking about it, yes. <laughs> I had no plans. I was wondering, what can I do? I said, yes, we're she said, like a memorial service, I said, yes! <laughs> That's what we're doing. 
doing a memorial service. And so I said, man, Trey, you're not preaching tonight. We're going we're gonna to do a memorial service. And this is 9 o'clock in the morning. About 12 o'clock, we had, we had planned this. We had, uh, so about 12, I said, man, you can't have a memorial service without a color guard. So I called the base. And I said, hey, I know it's late notice, but the accident just happened this morning. Would you guys send a color guard to our church? And they said, we'll get back with you. So they called me like five minutes later. They said, yes, we're coming with a color guard to your church to do a service. And then I, I called Chaplain Coggins, Mike Coggins. He's a re retired colonel chaplain at the base. And I said, Mike, will you do the opening prayer? Or will you do the scripture reading, the Old Testament scripture reading? And he said, yes. Then he called me back later. He said, Rachel was a reserve chaplain in the Army. She just retired. And we will both wear our uniforms. And she is from the base where four of those men came from in Louisiana. That's her home. That's where she grew up. And I said, oh, Lord, Jesus is putting this all together. And, and so Mike Collins gets up here. And, I mean, we just, we just, God was orchestrating the whole thing. And so it's about noon. And I said, we got to put the word out. So we put it out on Facebook, the woman's Facebook page. We called the Chamber of Commerce. They helped us put it out on their place. Um, what else? We, we called a bunch of places. Help spread the word. We want the whole town to come. And then Trey and I, we had the idea to make flyers, tell them about our service that night, Wednesday night. Remember how foggy it was still? Real foggy. And uh, so Trey and I take all these. We made a whole bunch of Jackie made a great flyer. So we cut it into half and I had a bunch of We went down to all the uh, news crews down in the Winn Dixie parking lot. Fox News was down there, MSNBC, all the big dogs were down there. So Trey and I show up, and I walk up to the circle of these people, and I, I hear what they're saying. And a lady reporter, and she was the one I was talking to earlier in the day. I didn't know what she looked like. She was telling them, did you hear about the memorial service at the Assembly of God Church? Yeah. I said, and I broke right in into the circle. I said, here's a flyer. <laughs> and then about 50 hands went. One guy, I recognize him off the TV. He's a reporter in um, Mobile. We get their station. He uh, reached out, and I was just, they're like taking him. Like all these secular atheists who are reaching for memorial, memorial flyers. I'm just giving out. I mean, how, how often does that happen, right? And then one crew says, hey, right? And I, and I introduced Trey or something. They found out Trey was a pastor. They started interviewing Trey. There's Trey. He was bold and standing tall and awesome. And uh, I forget who was interviewing him. And then they started interviewing me. And, and, and just the Spirit of God, I just felt the Spirit of God speaking life. Because I'm, I'm looking at the, you don't look at the camera, you look at the reporter. But I'm just sensing in my spirit that the families of those men were going to see this. So I started to speak hope and started to speak life and blessings. And uh, so we did that and we came back. When we put on the memorial service on Wednesday nights, we had reporters all down that wall and all over here. They had lights and cameras everywhere. And our people showed up. We had a great crowd here. And you guys started worshiping the Lord. Took a couple songs. Because you felt, I felt like I was in a fishbowl. I was up here playing, and I said, Trey, let's play slow songs. Let's do about five slow ones, but really good ones. And uh, so I said, we want the Spirit of God to move. You know, we don't want it to be dead, but we don't want to have it like a party atmosphere either. So, so we started playing these songs, and there's a guy with this flag that's beaming in on me, and the cameras are on me. And, and then they interviewed me before in the back. You guys were getting, a lot of you were interviewed. And so... I'm just thinking, here are all these heathen reporters all over. And, and we are worshiping God in front of them. Okay? And you guys started, it took a song or two, but man, you guys started worshiping. Next thing I know, hands are going up. Uh, I remember on the front row was um, the little boy from the neighborhood who's 10. Cameron. Cameron. Cameron just raised his hands. I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Cameron's worshiping Jesus in front of the whole world. And I said, boy, Cameron, I'm so proud of you. And I just said that. And then people, I just look around, you guys started worshiping the Lord. And these guys are just like observing God's people, connecting with God. And then, then we started preaching love and mercy and hope. <laughs> and I got up there and, and I just preached hope. I preached Jesus. I preached hope. And uh, I just felt the Spirit of God on me. And I just, you know, 
I be candid and honest with you today? I mean, I'm always honest, but I want to be transparent with you. Uh, I get nervous at funerals. Funerals are hard to do. And so, and especially, I can preach to 1,500 people if they're sitting in these brown chairs. But you get me in front of 20 people I don't know, I get nervous. It's weird. Isn't that weird? And so, um, I wasn't nervous a bit. <laughs> I was like, here the cameras are on. This would have been a perfect opportunity to freak out. <laughs> have a freak out moment. I've had freak out moments where I just forget. And, you know, um, <coughs> the Spirit of God was just on me. And I just preached and I administered love. And, hit, and, you know, that's the secret because all these reporters are probably brilliant, smart people. One guy, an older black gentleman, he was in the first Gulf War back in the 90s, whatever that was. And, and he was with Dan Rather for months and months. And this guy's a veteran's veteran reporter. And he was the sweetest. He just had the best time. And, I mean, these guys have been around the world. You, you think they have been in a service before? Oh, yeah. I guarantee you they've been in many, many services. I guarantee you they're at, uh, you know, uh, Whitney Houston's memorial service. They've been to many services. But the Spirit of God was moving in this place. And you guys were doing extravagant worshiping publicly. And I am so proud to be your pastor. I am so proud of you guys. Because when we put on Jesus for the world to see, you guys showed up and you worshiped. It was awesome. It was awesome. Ephesians 5, 16 says, Make the most of every opportunity because the, day, the days are evil. Are we ever going to get an opportunity like that again? Well, I don't know. I hope. I hope we do. I don't want to under that circumstance, though. Um, without Jesus, there's no hope. And so these reporters, they're full of words, but they don't know, they don't have any words of hope in times of crisis or any meaning. But we do. They came to our church, they heard a message of hope. Point number two, worship publicly. Your faith is out loud. Point number three, she worshipped Jesus in spite of her sinful past. She worshipped Jesus in spite of her sinful past. That's important. Because I was confused of this scripture first. Because it, it said that she was a sinful woman. But then I learned it was in the other gospels were saying it's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' and sister. I didn't know Lazarus' and sister. Mary was a sinner. I didn't know she was, might have been an ex-prostitute. She said she lived a sinful life. So I was kind of confused. And then I said, I'm going to look around. I'm going to study this a little more. And then I looked at John 11 too. And it says, uh, it's talking about Mary. It says, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So then that was the connection. Then I went to that story, which is in Luke 7.37. Turn your Bibles there. This is incredible. This is the same woman, a different different uh, view of the story. This tells you about her character. This tells you about her conversion, basically, of Mary, Lazarus' sister. You know, remember Mary and Martha? Okay, so Luke 7, 37 says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Okay? That's what she had. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Wow. That's repentance. When I give an altar call, people come forward. Most people come forward except Jesus. They're not weeping. But occasionally, you'll have people come down here and they're crying their eyes out. Because God's really touched them. And they've had a sinful life and they, they sense their sin. They sense their depravity. And they're giving it all up and they're receiving new life. And they are weeping for that reason. So here she is standing behind Jesus. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Wow. But then there's always a fly in the ointment. The Pharisees. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, talking about Jesus, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. See that spirit of religion? He said, tell me, teacher, 
Oh, Jesus said, tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them loved him more? Jesus' point, just like two sentences, set this guy straight with a story. Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt is forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman. Okay, Jesus looks at the woman. I'm sure the whole the whole room's looking at the woman. Jesus just trashed a Pharisee. Right? Uh, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Man. That's something, isn't it? In reality, everybody has sinned as much as the prostitute. We're totally depraved, totally not going to heaven. So it doesn't matter how much sin you committed. Sin is sin. We're all equally lost. So we should all be weeping at the feet of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? It takes a lot of humility to go out into public after you've had a bad reputation. Mike Nelson's probably a good example. He had a bad reputation in this town. We live in a small town. Everybody knew Mike. So I'm sure, Mike, it was probably hard for you to go back to church and start serving Jesus. Because all of your friends were just saying, I saw him at the bar. He's probably just putting on a show for his wife, trying to get back at her good graces. <laughs> They're just waiting. You know, they probably looked at you so skeptically. That's this woman. She came to Jesus, and Jesus defended her. It's hard for people to come out of the world and come to the church. I had a guy come to my church in Tallahassee, and he was a big old tall guy. He had a beautiful little family, two little boys. And he came, and he was—he had lost his license. He had three DUIs. He has drug charges. I mean, just a lot of trouble with the law. He was wanted in Leon County and Wakilia County, Wakulla County. <laughs> it's called Wakulla, but they say Wakilia, so it's a bad county. Okay. If you're going through, if you're driving in the woods, you see a sign that says Wakulla. Turn around. <laughs> That's where he was from. He was wanted in Wakilla, Wakilla and in Leon County, Tallahassee. And he came to church and he filled out a form. If you don't want me calling you, don't fill out a form. <laughs> right. He filled out a form. Big mistake, buddy. And so I called him up. I said, hey, man. I see you were at my church yesterday. You filled out a, a, a form. He goes, yeah. He had this real heavy southern accent. And he said, I'll tell you what. I felt like the devil himself walking in your church. And that brought some keen insight on how people feel who are sinners and they come into our churches. They feel bad. Right. They feel like the devil himself walking into the churches. So you know what that says to us church people? We need to love them as quickly as possible. Say, Lord, hey man, how you doing? We are so glad you're here. And inside their heads are going, you don't know me. We got one chance, man. Make the most of every opportunity. The days are evil. Our churches should be so welcoming and loving. So today you might feel that way. You come into this church, you're probably feeling like I feel like the devil himself. I feel like everybody's looking at me. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you, come to Jesus anyways. Because the real Christians, this church is, man, you guys are real Christians. You you the real Christians in this church have been there, done that. They bought the t-shirt. They've lived their wild lives. A lot of them have made bad mistakes. And they came to Jesus, and now they've been serving Jesus a long time. Your biggest fans are here in this church. You might be thinking, everybody's looking at me. You might be thinking, I'm not welcome. You might be thinking, I don't fit in. But guess what? You do, and you are welcome. You do fit in here. And we are your biggest fans. We are glad you're here. And we want you to go get your rowdy friends and bring them here too. <laughs> we ain't scared. 
We love people. Amen? So you got your biggest supporters are here. The power of Jesus to change your life is here in this church. You might say, no, God would not love me. I've done too many bad things. Wrong. The power of God is here to change your life. Well, I'm addicted to alcohol. Well, good. He likes fixing that problem. Well, I dip stuff. Well, that's an easy one for God. Well, I chew tobacco. I dip. I smoke. Well, so what? The God who created your little body and formed it in the womb can take that addiction away from you like that. God loves when people come to Him. He loves to heal you. And you're in a church that loves to heal you. We'll help you in the process. There's only one thing on earth that all of heaven rejoices over. It's when one sinner comes and repents of his sin. The Bible says all of heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. The angels don't rejoice when you make your first million dollars. The angels don't rejoice when you graduate college, as cool as that is. The angels don't rejoice when you get your GED, as awesome as that is. The angels could care less. You could make a hole in one of golf. They don't even look over the gates of heaven. <laughs> hole in one of them. So what? There's been a million of those. They can care less. But when a sinner repents of their sins, oh, they all, hey, gather around, angel man. They're watching, man. Down there in the bar, first single soul gives the heart to the Lord Jesus. There's like a million angels looking over heaven. Start the band. <laughs> so give it. Jimmy Hendrix start the guitar. No, I don't know. <laughs> start it up. We gotta get the house rocking, man. Someone got saved in, because it, it it seems so insignificant. Someone gave their heart to Jesus. No, it's huge. I remember when I gave my heart to Jesus at 17. I left a world of nastiness. I came. I left all my friends. I thought I had my. I had probably. Maybe one, but I had thought I had like seven. I thought I had some cool friends who really liked me, but no, I didn't. And then when I came to church, I started serving Jesus. Man, I got a ton of great friends. Real people who loved me, not for what I had. And so, man, angels rejoice. And I never looked back. Man, I got saved at age 17, and I've been serving Jesus ever since. It's powerful when you make a decision to follow Jesus. Because you know what? We're not going to coerce you into serving Jesus. It's all free will. Right? I'm not going to put pressure on you. Do these tricks. Pastors have tricks to get you to the altar. There's tricks. I know them. And I don't play with trick cards to get you to ask Jesus into your heart. Because if I trick you into doing it or scare you into doing it, and you raise your hands, and then you go off and go back to your old lifestyle, what have I gained? Nothing. But I, I present the gospel to you in a powerful way, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and you decide to follow Jesus, right? And you leave this church and you change your life and leave your life of sin, and you serve Jesus, and you come back Wednesday and Sunday, right? And then what have I gained? A lot, yeah, yeah. I'll, I started partying in heaven again. I'm a party maker, brother. I love it. Let me ask you to bow your heads and pray with me. How many of you said to me, Pastor, you know, I've never asked Jesus in my heart. I, I'm, a, I'm a sinner. I admit it. I do my own thing. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. How many of you said to me, Pastor, I need you to pray for me because I'd like to give my heart to the Lord. Anybody raise their hand and say, pray for me? Yes, I see a hand. Anybody else? Lift it real high so I can see it. Yes, I see a hand. Yes. I see a hand in the back. Awesome. Yes, I see a hand. You can put them down. I tell you, you're, doing, you're making the greatest decision. You're putting your life on a trajectory that's not only going to make your life awesome, but it's going to make your kids' life awesome and your grandchildren's life. You're on, you're you're changing the whole trajectory of your life, which is huge. You're being adopted into the family of God. Now God's got your back. Now, now God is your father. You're his children. He's going to take care of you. He's going to cre create some great in you. What you're doing here means so much. Your decision. The Bible says when we ask Jesus in our heart that he writes our name in this book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. 
I, I've never seen that book, but one day I can't wait to run through the pages and see that book. Because God writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. And when you ask Him, if you truly repent of your sins, repentance means this. You say, I'm sorry for sinning. And then you stop sinning. You turn the other way. You start living for God. Right? Remember I talked about the cost, the extravagant cost of following Jesus? Following Jesus is the hardest thing you'll ever do. It's a super challenge. But you have a divine friend, the Holy Spirit, that God puts in your heart when you repent of your sins. The Holy Spirit will help you. He'll teach you the Bible. He'll help you with your temper. He'll help you with your, your, your temptations. You can't do it on your own. It's not a matter of just changing your ways. It's not a matter of being good. It's not a matter of just stopping drinking. God goes right for the heart. He puts a whole new heart in you. And you become a whole new creation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that when a man repents, he becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, and behold, all things are new. So you're making a decision to follow Christ. How many of you say to me, Pastor, I've given my heart to Jesus before. You know, I've kind of fallen away from the Lord. You know, life get, got busy. I didn't have time for church. I didn't, you know, I'm raising children. But I need to get back in, in touch with the Lord. I need to give my heart back to Him. I need to come back to the Lord. How many raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me? Yes, I see a hand. I see a hand. Anybody else? Yes, I see a hand over there. Yes. Hallelujah. God loves you. He wants you back. Want you back. Let's pray this. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Adopt me into your family. Put your Holy Spirit in my heart. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive that. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now check this out. We have cards. We have cards called connection cards. If you gave your heart to the Lord, or you rededicated your heart to the Lord, I want you to fill this out real quickly. Take out a pen. Take out this card. I want you to tell me about it. Right? Just tell me about it. And fill the card out. Put in the offering. We're about to take the offering. And we don't want you to put anything in the offering. We don't need your money. You put the card in there. And I'm going to start praying for you. Okay? You need someone to pray for you. Serious business what we're doing. We have a lot of fun doing it, but I'll tell you what, it's serious business. Because your soul is weighing the balance. Their souls weighing the balance. And we love you and we're going to pray for you. Because I'll tell you, here's what's going to happen. When you commit your heart to the Lord, the devil's going to come after you to get you to go back on your commitment. Remember your year did this, remember that, remember, remember, remember. You're going to be hearing these voices, you're not really saved. You just lifted your hand. It doesn't really mean anything. That's the voice you're going to hear in your head. You're going to have to answer him back. Say, get me behind me, Satan. I am really saved. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. It's been forgiven. It's under the blood. God doesn't even remember it. I'm not the old drunk. I'm not the old sinner. I'm a saint. Give me my sword. I'm in the army of God now. I'm a new person. I'm not going back to that old lifestyle. You need to look the devil square in the face and say, look, I'm not going there. I'm not playing your games. You're not going to put guilt on me. I gave my heart to the Lord. I'm born again. Jesus said a man must be born again. Okay? Spiritually, we get reborn. It's a spiritual thing that happens. It's so awesome. So we're going to ask our ushers to come forward and take the offering.